real practical examples of the power of being in honour. And some of the areas that we've discussed previously about the multiple forms of law are explained when you click on the link on law and the structure of the law. And there are still some gaps, and I'm sorry for that, but we will be, you know, we'll be working on finishing those. But there are a number of good, I, f I feel hopefully useful articles there for all of you to have a look at. And I encourage you to look and keep looking as updates are made to this section in the hope of helping all of you understand the importance of honour, of respect, and of your right not to consent in success at court. Okay, I'm not going to spend uh, more time on that because I'll, I'll allow you all to, to please read those things and, and come back to me. Uh, in the time that's still available, I want to cover the, the, the last three things here. The Great Divine Writs, uh, updates to EIM and what we're doing to try and get that process working and relate to that trust accounts and the alternatives that are available to us if we continue to meet deliberate obstruction from the system. So let's get into the great writs of justice. Now if you're at the home page of one-heaven.org you will see that there is a new box to the very left underneath the entrance to the covenant says great writs of justice explanation steps and uses. If you click on that you will actually go to a section at this point of the covenant that explains the great writs. Now over the coming week and a bit we are actually developing examples for each of these great writs and the material that goes with them and how to use them. So what's the first use of a great divine writ? Well, say as a number of people have already experienced that you're at the point of perfecting the agricultural lien against a clerk or a judge and you get a visit by marshals, by sheriffs, by law enforcement officials that don't leave their business card. Really, it's an intimidation. And they say to you that if you continue, we know all about what you're doing, why? Because it's all here, public. Anyone can go here. They can go here and read it. We know what you're going to do. Probably don't understand it, but we know what you're going to do. And if you do that, we will arrest you and you will go to prison for a long time. Now, of course, this is corruption. Of course. But when you're faced with people who are holding very, very important jobs and jobs that should never act in such a corrupt way, it does work. It is intimidation. And I defy anyone not to be intimidated by that kind of corrupt behaviour. So when you are faced with that kind of harassment, it would be imprudent then to complete the process on your own of issuing the fourth and final writ. Instead, there is a system called the Great Divine Writs, which are available, where we raise the stakes. We no longer deal with bridge trials that are intimidating and working for members of the bar. We go straight to the top. And this is the purpose of the Great Writs. Now, I want to just cover a few conceptual points on them, how they're to be used, and why they will have enormous, enormous impact in their system. And then I will leave it for the moment until the actual examples will be available in coming weeks. But here's, here's a number of things about great writs that are unique. The first is this. If, if one is claiming an office, then one is claiming an ecclesiastical position. One's claiming an office one is claiming an ecclesiastical position. Let me explain. An office is a description of a space, hence why we work in an office and why we call a position an office. It is a space. And that space, when we hold an office, 
is sanctified. And the way that a space is sanctified, most often under their system, is it for it to be circumscribed. And you've probably seen this word circumscribed used within the ecclesiastical deeds because that's exactly what happens when you issue an ecclesiastical deed on behalf of the divine against these mad people, insane people in dishonour. When you are willing to do that for the divine, you are granted and are given, you are circumscribed. And that means if anyone touches you, anyone, they're in dishonour. If you are manhandled, if you're arrested, if you're thrown in prison and you have issued an ecclesiastical deed, they have stepped out of bounds and they immediately put themselves under dire jeopardy, under binding and extreme dishonour. And the most powerful people in the world know that and the bridge trolls don't and they don't care and the system is broken because they don't know and they don't care. But if someone senior claims an office, then it is ecclesiastical. It is circumscribed. And it may as well be called a chapel or a chamber or a sanctuary or a temple. And in fact, certain offices do in fact have that. The office of the president is a chapel it is an ecclesiastical space because it is an ecclesiastical office now i've been saying this what's the deep meaning of this with great writs well if someone is claiming an ecclesiastical office they are claiming their power comes from the divine that's what ecclesiastical means it means that they are saying my powers that i'm using to imprison to make money to control land, to control you, to do what I'm doing, I'm claiming comes from the divine. Now, okay, they're claiming it may come from the Roman system, but they're still claiming it comes from the divine. Well, if they're claiming it comes from the divine and from heaven, then the covenant of one heaven says, you give us the right to issue a live-born record. You are under the membership rules of heaven. You have consented the flesh has consented to be judged by the rules of heaven. The spirit he has. Now in our canon we say that if anyone is born to this world, then they have consented to be here. You cannot render the spirit incompetent. The spirit is part of the divine. No one can render the divine incompetent. It means that when someone holds an office, whether it be a bishop or an attorney general or a governor, or a secretary of state, or a president, or a pope, or commissioner, then they are openly consenting that they are subject to the rules of heaven. And we, and you, are the ambassadors of the divine now to remind them of their obligations, which they have forgotten and which they refuse to obey. So a great writ is a writ between members. It is not a writ sent to someone where they say, I will ignore this writ. Uh, Not at all. It is a writ that is issued between members. They have no right to say, I do not recognize it. No right at all. In fact, when a writ is issued and it is ignored, then the member ipso facto, as a matter of fact, declares themselves, confesses themselves to be incompetent. And in doing so, enables a judgment to be rendered. As if they had consented. Very powerful. There is no argument. There is no one in the world that can argue that when a great writ is issued, it is anything other than a writ between members. Now, there are three members, three individuals that choose, or individuals that choose to place their blood thumbprints on that writ. The writ's in two parts. The deed of interrogatories, which is, could be a document that's 20 pages long, and the writ itself in blue, which is only a page, single page. 
But there are now three other members that add to this. And they are the witnesses to the Great Writ. And the witnesses to the Great Writ are three departed spirits who have held the same position as the individual you're writing to has and their numbers and their names are attached to the writ as proof of the authority of the writ and as witness to either the honour or the dishonour of the recipient member, whether they be the head of the FBI, the President of the United States, Secretary of State, whomever. So, for example, if a great writ is to be issued to Obama, and there's plenty of reasons that great writs should be issued to Obama, but if there was a great writ issued to Obama, it means there will be three peers that by their numbers and their names ascribed to that writ are witnesses, in addition to the trinity of the divine in three separate blood seals. Those three presidents will be witness. Washington, Lincoln, Adams. And one of the things that we'll be doing on the register is making available the entry of spirits. Your departed parents. My parents have departed. Your grandparents. Brothers or sisters, cousins and aunts, uncles, ancestors and office holders that we have the right, we have the absolute right to record as members an issue. So Great Writ is a document of extreme paradox and whenever something is presented and it is an extreme paradox, there you have the divine present. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the words we use to better understand the nature of the universe is unique collective awareness. What is unique collective? How can something be unique and collective? How can something be collective and unique? It is a paradox. Life is a paradox. Death is a paradox. Birth is a paradox. So whenever you hear something and it sounds paradoxical to the extreme, then have no fear because you are witnessing the presence of the divine, absolutely. And the great writs are documents of supreme paradox. So that if a president such as Obama denies a great writ, they declare themselves incompetent. They deny these presidents are members of heaven. They deny the Trinity exists. They deny the ancient principle of tribunal. They deny that law has any value. They deny their entire world in one document. Thus, great writs will be recorded forever as actions of the Supreme Court of Heaven on public notice forever. So that even if the parasites that surround Obama think this is some sick joke and in their present state of extreme illness refuse to stop their plans then in two years, three years, four years, five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years history will be the judge of who was right and who was wrong. And history is not on their side when men refuse to see history for what it is. And these men are way out of bounds. So that's a point before we get on to EONNs and trust accounts, just to remember this. Nothing that we're doing is guaranteed 100% to win. Nothing. But we are adding something to what we're doing. And that is by doing it properly, doing it with honour, doing it with history, then over time, we will be proven to be correct. So it does require a discipline. It requires, yes, it requires a certain amount of faith, but it certainly requires a discipline to realise that everything we're doing 